All right, grace and peace, everyone. Thank you for joining in and the ones who are going to watch it later. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going. This is our first lesson, first week, going through uh, systematic theology, particularly uh, Wayne Grudem's systematic theology, uh, which is a great help, great systematic theology. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, sister, honestly, there. Uh, didn't Rev? Didn't you tell me Erickson was a Calvinist? Yeah, I thought Erickson was a Calvinist. If I'm not all mistaken. right, now honestly, <laughs> <laughs> I told her we work it on there. There we go. We, there we go. My boy okay. Des Ingram. I see my boy Des Ingram. Thanks for joining, brother. Yeah, old Dez. What's going on? Okay. This is running slow, but let's see here. Close that. All right, so today we're going to be covering uh, the first two chapters uh, of Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, which is basically his introduction into what is systematic theology why we need to study it, how should we study it. And then chapter two, he's going to jump into the word of God overall. And so we're going to look at that uh, as well. I see some YouTube, uh, Facebook stuff. Okay. Post. All right, so let me go get started. My computer is running slow, everyone. Sorry. It's all good. Devil's always busy when we trying to go into the Word oh, and man. learn. And it's much needed right now, too, and I appreciate it. I just want to say thank you, Ref, for even thinking about doing this. Um, I know we talked about it before, um, and you kind of mentioned it, and I really appreciate you following through with it, and it's definitely needed in this hour. So I'm really looking forward to these lessons. Man, it is definitely needed. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, every you know, everyone definitely needs a good biblical sound theology because there's so much bad theology out there. Um, and again, some people don't like Grudem. Some people don't like, you know, Erickson's or Ryrie's. Uh, you should never agree with anyone's stuff 100%. You know, you go through it yourself pull out what's good, what's biblical. So we'll go through Grudem. There we go. Let's see, it won't let me post. Uh, my YouTube channel is uh, JT Mac. It's uh, Rev C. Man, I'm trying to see if it'll let me. I can link it in there. Okay, thank I'll, you. Thank I'll you. go in there and do it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Dunamis. Grace and peace, everyone. All right, so we're going to get started. Uh, the computer wants to act a little slow, but. Again, uh, for those who are joining, you don't have to have the book to take the lessons. Uh, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to try to link uh, the notes with each video. Um, you can find free PDFs out there of this book. So you don't have to go spend your money unless you want to. Let's go systematic. I need to find a way to make you uh, in control, too brother okay one day <laughs> all right there we go uh we'll, we'll do that again oh yeah it's, it's, yeah it's first try it's all good yep yep sister honestly she said you know it's on uh audiobook as well so you know, guys, use the use the chat and the comments to interact with each other, ask questions, uh, share resources, so we can help each other. 
All right, systematic theology, Wayne Grudem. Let's get started. So, first off, theology needs to be explicitly based on the teachings of Scripture. Not on our tradition, not on what our pastor says, what uh, any denomination. Theology needs to be explicitly based, rooted, grounded, pulled from the teachings of Scripture. And what do we mean by Scripture? The 66 books of the closed canon. And I know probably about two weeks that's going to cause some good discussions. So just be prepared for that. We'll go over the Apocrypha and all of that. All right, so I got the chat pulled up over here. So theology needs to be based on the teachings of Scripture. And one thing you'll see as you read through Grudem, and I appreciate about Grudem, um, is when he gives Scripture references, they're always the full reference. You know, you're not just a half a verse or... A verse here, a verse there. His 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 book is filled with scriptural references. There's uh, memory verses in the end as well. So the church, the church needs good theology that engages our hearts, our hands, and our minds, um, because that's what we need at, to fulfill the Great Commission to be out there to make disciples, to teach them. Uh, teach everyone what Christ has commanded us. All right. So if there, if you see any questions, you can bring them up to my attention. No problem. I will. All right. So what is systematic theology? This is, I am using the blue cover of Grudem. So this may be the second edition. So the pages may be a little off. Uh, let me see. This is... Maybe the first or second edition. So on page 21 is where this is pulled from. So what is systematic theology? Systematic theology, is this is the definition that's going to govern Grudem's book and our discussions, is any study that answers the question, what does the whole Bible, tota, tota scriptura, we have scripture alone, but all of scripture. What does the whole Bible teach us today? about any given topic. And so you have angelology, pneumatology, soteriology. All of those are theologies that we're, we've, we've pulled all the scriptures together to see what the Bible says on that. Um, systematic theology. And there's other theologies that he talks about, you know, historical theology, uh, evangelical theology. There's all these different types of theologies, but systematic is you're putting it together. You're taking scriptures and you're putting them together. And so it involves collecting and understanding all relevant patches, passages on topics. So it's not just cherry picking scriptures because it has a word that you like and you put it in. You have to collect it, but also understand it properly interpret it, and is it relevant to our passage? Is it? I mean, is it relevant to the topic we're discussing? And we'll see. There's a good book by James Sire, I think it is, S-I-R-E, called uh, Scripture Twisting. And he goes over like 20... Let me see how many... I would highly recommend that book. 20, yep. Yeah. So it's called Scripture Twisting Methods of the Cults by James Sire. And he goes over 20 different ways that cults misuse scripture. And that's a very, very good book to get. Things like uh, they'll twist a translation. So they'll go get one that reads the way they want it to. Uh a biblical hook where they'll just grab your attention with it and then go off. Kind of like the Mormons where they'll say, you know, James 1, 5, God promises you to get wisdom to those who ask him. And then they'll go on to say, well, that's what Joseph Smith did. You know, he wanted wisdom. He asked God. So they'll use a biblical verse to hook you and pull you into their, their heresy. 
Uh, they ignore immediate context. And so these are different ways. So that's a good book. James Sire, uh, Scripture, twi Scripture Twisting Methods of the Cults. Um, so you, we summarize what these scriptures clearly teach so that we know what to believe about each topic. Uh, I think uh, Elder Mike has a great, I think a great series of videos on biblical uh, hermeneutics. And that's very much needed today. How the, hermeneutics is the art and the skill of biblical interpretation. It's an art form where the more you do it, you, you get better at it. And then it's skillful. It, 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 there are skills to this. So then here's a quote that uh, I love to use. I kind of adopted it myself. That theology is not a hat for your head. It's not something to wear around so you can brag that you know, you know, I know the ontological argument for the existence of God. Well, that's good for you. But how does it affect your walk? So theology is not a hat for your head, but rather shoes for your feet. Theology is to be applied and walked out in your daily life. So you don't study theology to brag. Uh, you don't study theology to try to win arguments. It's how is this practical to my everyday life? Uh, any comments, Brother Leo? You want to say anything on that part or so far? No comments, man. I'm uh, I'm actually reading along as you're talking, so um, this is good. Okay. Um, kind of, I'm gonna start taking notes too, so I'll jump in though. Okay. Because when I switch to the, I can't really see what's going on on the screen, so I need Dunamis. Shout out to Dunamis. I need read. <laughs> so, uh, it's all good. So Berean got his dunamis. I need. I got you. I'm gonna use you as my dunamis. There we go. <laughs> Shout out to Berean. So what? What are doctrines? So this is around about page twenty-five here. Doctrines. A doctrine is what the whole Bible, the whole Bible teaches us today about some particular topic. Doctrines are the result of us doing systematic theology. So what we're going through as a whole with Grudem, what he has done, what other theologians have done, what you get at the end is what we call doctrines. Not man-made, you know, this comes from getting in there, digging in the scriptures, uh, looking at the, co the, the context, the, the grammar, how the syntax, what, what does the entire Bible say? We put it together. And then that is what comes out as a doctrine. And so the seven major doctrines or se seven major doctrines, which Grudem will cover uh, is the word of God, bibliology, uh, the doctrine of God, theology proper, doctrine of man, anthropology, the doctrine of Christ and the Holy Spirit, Christology, pneumatology, uh, doctrine of the application of redemption, soteriology, Doctrine of the Church, Ecclesiology, and Doctrine of the Future, Eschatology, or the End Times. And so those is what his book is going to cover, ultimately. Uh, and we'll break those apart as we go through them. So again, what is a doctrine? It's not man-made. A doctrine is what the whole Bible teaches us today about some particular topic. Can I kind of ask a question on that and kind of speak to yes, that? Sir. So when people speak on sp specific ideas and mentions within scripture, they sometimes I've seen oftentimes, especially in the charismatic movie, I hate to say it, they take uh, bits and pieces of the Bible and then apply it and then say that's what they believe, not specifically the whole Bible teaches in a particular topic. So can you kind of mm -hmm. break that part to where people pick out specific things and make a doctrine out of it rather than the whole entire Bible and then including that into a particular topic? Yeah. Um, so you, you you have people who will, because again, you know, you can make the Bible say what you want it to say. You can make it agree with your different theologies. Um, some people will take, there's a passage and it's usually the obscure passages they find 
There's a passage in Zechariah, maybe chapter four or so, where it, they use, I've seen them use it to say that this is talking about satellites, like TBN was big on using this, this chapter to talk about uh, the flying scrolls, I think chapter five, to say that that's a satellite today. Uh, there's one where they try to say angels are females because of like there's some stuff in Zechariah and they'll pull these scriptures out of context away from uh, the, the overall uh, teaching of the Bible and make a whole doctrine out of it. Like we saw last night, um, like uh, Mark 16, they'll take that one little passage or verse from Mark 16, which is a disputed text and build a whole doctrine of snake handling or drinking poison. And right. so it's like, it can be dangerous. It can be dangerous to your health. Bad theology is dangerous to your health. Put that out there for people. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Did you have, did you have a, an example as well? Yeah. I was thinking um, specifically um, not necessarily dealing like with camps and stuff, but I know like just come from the Pentecostal background. Um, I think one a lot of people will try to take specifics from the gospels and then apply it to all the scripture. Like um, one thing would be um, they'll take one thing about uh, uh, Jesus taking uh, five loaves of bread and then they'll try mm. to say, okay. Um, and no, no, not, not enough five loaves uh, when it comes to the marriage and he actually turned water into wine. They'll apply that and say, okay, it's okay for all of us to drink wine forever. It doesn't have any issues. So they start applying small instances to the whole entire Bible to where we have, we specifically have moderation, but then they'll start moving that goalpost to where, okay, we can have wine. We can have these particular things because Jesus did it. And then they'll kind of wipe away what mo some of the Old Testament was speaking on in specific instances, but then they'll say, oh, but now we're in a new covenant. And they'll take one specific idea um, in terms of liberties that we have and then say, oh, they're not seeing we can do these. We can just do as we will. And I think one thing that hopefully I'm learning through this process is when we understand liberty in Christ and how that applies to our doctrine and theology, mm. um, kind of kind of root that out a little bit, because that's something I know for me. That's why I want to learn a lot from this and specifics on having that liberty in Christ and kind of how sound is that and to what degree do we go? Because I see a lot of people take that. And Ron wouldn't say we can pretty much do anything. And I see a lot of folks doing it saying, well, uh, David had an issue with um, his uh, his lust. So it's OK for me to have an issue with my lust. So it doesn't matter what I do. I'm under grace. And it's just like, wow, like y'all just really taking one instance out of scripture and just saying I'm OK. Mm. This is wild, man. It is. It is. Let's see. Trying to see, if, um, did uh, JT Mac get the link? Oh, he got the link. Yeah, he's on YouTube now. Okay, okay. Yep. And so those are the the major doctrines there. Further. All right, here we go. Why should Christians study theology? Why should Christians study theology? I'm going to pull up Matthew 28 here in just a second. So the Great Commission, uh, because of teaching, teaching, didasco, instructing, we have to interpret and apply the life and teachings of Christ. And we're making disciples. Disciples make disciples. Your, your disciple, uh, mathetes, means student, pupil, uh, Star Wars fans, apprentice learners. So theology is important because the Great Commission matters. Good sound theology is important because there are souls on the line. So we, to effectively teach ourselves and to teach others, which we're commanded to do, what the Bible says, we have to collect and summarize all the scriptures on a particular subject. And I think a lot of times um, we don't, we don't, you know, we're, we're such a fast paced society that no one wants to sit and go through what does the entire Bible say about healing? What does the entire Bible say about tongues? What does not just, five, you know, two or three scriptures, but let's look at the entire Bible. Um, 
so uh, so it, it matters because we have to collect it, we summarize it, and we teach it to make disciples. So let me pull up uh, Matthew 28 really quick. Hey, dispensational Tim. share my screen i'm gonna be quiet for about a good 10 15 minutes i gotta take a quick call and i'll be i'll be on though oh you're good all right guys i'm just about to pull up scripture here because this is one where we're gonna you know we're gonna walk through these scriptures because that's what it's about so let's look at Matthew 28, 18. Okay, make sure it's shown on the screen. Okay, so when Jesus came up, Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority, pasa exousia, all authority, power has been given to me, in heaven and on earth. And so we kind of talked about this, about how he's given this power because he is about to issue a great command as a king. He is issuing a command, not an option, not something if you feel like it. This is a great commission. So he issues this commission. Go, therefore, and this is actually a participle in the Greek. So it's in your going or as you go, as you go about your daily life, whatever you're doing, make disciples. This is the command here. All the other participles get their power, their their, their movement, from, their meaning from this main verb. So the main verb is make disciples uh, of all nations, panta ta ethne, all ethnic groups, make disciples out of all ethnic groups, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there, there's a trinity here. Uh, baptizing, which I'm sure mo all of us pretty much know, to dip, to immerse. Uh, teaching the Dasco, teaching them to keep all that I commanded you. So how can we command them or how can we teach them if we don't know what we're supposed to be teaching? So this is why systematic theology is important. We have to know what we're teaching. Then we instruct it to them. So disciples make disciples that make disciples. It's a process. All that I've commanded you and behold, I am with you. I am with you in the midst, literally, meta. I am right among you always, all the days, even to the end of the age. So that's comfort that the all-powerful Jesus Christ is with us, in the midst of us, as we are carrying out his command and going and making disciples, teaching them, baptizing them uh, into the name. So we're baptizing them into, you know, not a magic formula. We're baptizing them into a relate into a, a relationship, an allegiance to this great King, even to the end of the age. So that's comfort. You know, some people their personality type may not be. Uh, extroverted to go out there and just get in people's face and make disciples. But we can take comfort that no matter your personality type, God, the Holy Spirit, Christ is there with you always. So that is a comforting text that we can have. All right. So let me uh, jump back into our slides there. Hey, Elder Tim, again, thanks, guys, for, for jumping in and watching, and those who are going to watch later. Uh, we're in, uh, we're studying Wayne Grudem. We're in chapters one and two for our first lesson here. 
of systematic theology. All right, so let me pull the slides back up. If, again, if there's any questions, just drop them in the comments. I'm going to drop the link in the comments, too, if anybody wants to pop in. Give me a second. It's like the, the devil is bit. The, commu the computer wants to slow down right when I'm getting into a flow. Paste. There we go. All right. So there's the link for this, you know, if anybody wants to jump into the, the stream yard, there's the link there. Oh, that was a good comment I wanted to bring up here. Most excellent. Most excellent. Jesus uses his exousia to issue a new command to his followers. Amen. That is powerful. A uh, great point to bring out there. Computer is slowing down, guys. I'm still here. Hang on. Let's share, share, share. All right. Get my slides. Hang on. Here we go. All right, so there we go. Now we're going. So why do we study theology? Why is theology important? It helps us overcome our wrong ideas. It helps us overcome our wrong ideas. Is it prayer for my laptop? Hey, I got to get a Mac. Yep. So we're, uh, it helps us overcome our wrong ideas. Why do we study theology? It helps us make better decisions later based on new questions of doctrines that may arise. So we, we, we're fighting these wrong ideas. Good theology will help us answer questions that come up later about doctrine, but also Studying theology helps us grow as Christians. It helps us grow as Christians. Uh, I'm not going to pull these scriptures up, because, you know, just because I don't want issues going on with the the stream. So if you were, if you're a truly saved believer, you'd have your scriptures open with you right now. But that's a different discussion. First Timothy six and three. If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with sound, healthy teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching uh, that promotes godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions. So that's First Timothy 6. But... Timothy tells us here that good theology leads to good living. It promotes yesubia, godliness, well worship, good worship. And so true worship, you, you worship God. True worship comes by giving God his proper place. Again, we uh, America, especially over here, in, in America, we have such a low view of God. We have a low view of God. And true worship comes when you give God his proper place. And so the more you know about God, the easier it is to love him and to worship him. And so we need this good theology. And so good theology promotes good living. 
It promotes good living because it, it promotes sanctification because you understand the doctrine of God, one of his attributes is holiness. And so we want to be holy because he is holy. He sets the standards, not us. He sets the standards. Hey, grace and peace, grace and peace, uh, Van Harris, uh, most excellent everyone, grace and peace again. Uh, and, so, and so good theology helps us grow as Christians. It helps us grow as Christians, and it leads to godliness. It leads to good worship. Uh, it leads to sanctification. How do we study systematic theology? How should we study systematic theology? Again, uh, welcome everyone in the chat who's watching on the different streams. Uh, like, Hit the like button, share it, get it out there to people. Uh, so how should we study systematic theology? Uh, this is around about page 32, 33 in Grudem's book. So these are this is pulling from his book here. Uh, with prayer, that's number one, with prayer. Um, so, so we ask for guidance. We ask for revelation or illumination, which as we study the uh, pneumatology, the, the study of the Holy Spirit, one of his roles, one of his activities is illumination. And so we we pray before we study, before we crack open the Bible, we pray for illumination. We pray for the Holy Spirit to do that work that only he can do, that only he, he does. Psalm 119 is something that I pray every time I open the Bible. Psalm 119, 176 verses all about the word of God. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law, out of your Torah. Um, I'm trying to see. You know, you know the Hebrew is going to get, you know, the Hebrew is going to try to get you on that. Oh, I know that Torah. Yeah, oh yeah. As <laughs> soon as they see the word law. Yeah. As soon as they see the word law, okay. Well, you see the prioritization on the word. That they see that's they gonna try to get you. Oh yeah, oh yes. Let's see one of the comments. They were there. Uh, looks like honestly and uh, most excellent are running amok in this comment section over here. <laughs> Look, I can't see it all the way. I know it's also about Calvinism or something, but we'll save that. So one nineteen, Psalm one nineteen eighteen. Uh, the, the Hebrew word for open there is galah, is, is to uncover. Give me the full provision that I can that I can contemplate, behold, marvel at the wondrous things from your instruction, your Torah. And so that is something that um, no matter what scriptures you're opening up to, no matter you know what you're about to study, ask for guidance, ask for uh, illumination, revelation. You're not going to get a new revelation, but ask for him to uncover things that you can see. Because, and that's one thing we're going to learn about the God's word, that progressive revelation. You can read John 3 16 every day for the rest of your life and still see something new in that passage. Uh, type of one, if you guys have read a passage multiple times and then came back and saw something new. Uh, has it happened to you, Brother Leo? It definitely has. I think one big thing would be, um, even as like growing up, I may have thought one thing about a particular scripture. Um, I know for me, thinking back, uh, I know I used to think of, um, I used to think, one thing about like spirits in general, like, oh, there's mm. a, there's a, 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 like not necessarily a bunch of spirits for everything, but that's kind of what my 
thought was like test the spirit by the spirit. So I used to apply that like, OK, so if somebody is uh, being like real deceitful right now, they must have a deceitful spirit. So I used to start pl- applying it wildly because I came out of Pentecostal church. Uh, they mm. applied everything to love spirit, to uh, you got any type of thing. And then going into the scriptures, understand there are specific specific scriptures, uh, specific spirits that are called out. I thought that everything that people were doing had a spirit behind it and had a name behind it. But like, to me, that didn't line up with scripture. So I had an understanding of what try to spirit by the spirit meant, but also I didn't understand that that was speaking more to the actual root and who that person is in terms of, is that the Holy ghost mm. moving or is that really uh, un- uh, necessarily like a, a, another spirit moving? Not, not like I'm naming different demons and stuff like that. I'm not doing that, but it's like, that's something I had to learn at one point in time. I was thinking everybody had a spirit and I was naming everything and I was just conditioned the wrong way, but reading it for myself and getting rooted in understanding and getting some sound teaching to really help me understand that it, uh, it showed me something different. Cause I used to see it in a whole different light. Every time I saw the scripture, I thought it was talking about millions of demons and spirits out here. That's for every type of emotion, every type mm. of reaction. That's just how I used to think. Yep. Amen. I'm looking at some of the comments. As they come, there was one uh, lyrically outspoken. Are you able to put comments up, Leo? Uh, no, you gotta make me like an admin or something. On admin, that. okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll work on that. Uh, but she, uh, not she, but lyrically outspoken says it's going so fast. Something about new leaves sprouting from the same branch. Yeah, I yeah. Think that's good. That is that is good. How that that, and it shows us that the word of God. Uh, Hebrews chapter uh, four, it's active, it's living, Zoe. It's it's alive because it's the very breath of God. It's Theo Nutas. So when you breathe and you put your hand in front of your face and you feel that breath, that's how intimate God's word is. And he is to his word when he inspired it, he breathed it out. It's alive, it's living, uh, it's powerful. And so we're going to study all of that in the upcoming weeks with about studying the word of God that we should never go in saying, oh, I've read this scripture before. No, you go in with fresh eyes, open my eyes that I can behold. I can contemplate the wondrous things out of your law, your Torah. Elder Tim, I'm working on these wrenches, man. I got to find them. I got to figure out how to do all that stuff. So, yeah, uh, let's see. Could you speak to that when you say, like, when you see, the like, for me, when I see spiritual activity, and I'm actually pulling these scriptures up on my own now, mm-hmm. but can you kind of speak to what that spiritual activity, because, like, seeing uh, your reference and from scripture of Psalm 119 and 18, like, open my eyes, of course, that is spiritually necessarily not open our physical eyes but like understanding that we have to have to be i, I I've, I've been conditioned with this idea of revelation god has to reveal his word to us um it's not us outwardly doing things to gain all this knowledge but god will then reveal his word to us spiritually can you kind of speak to that spiritual activity in these scriptures in uh first corinthians and ephesians oh yeah yeah let's um let's actually go to uh first corinthians Chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two, you'll find that right after First Corinthians chapter one. So that is, you know, that's one proof of inspiration of scripture, how it flows. Amen. <laughs> it flows. So first Corinthians chapter two. Um, you know what? Let me go ahead and pull I'm gonna pull this up. I'm gonna step out in faith here. And the only reason I ask, because like I think a lot of people need to understand and see it, because like these are good references, because I'm looking at them now, and I just mm-hmm. think some people when they speak to spiritual activity, people minds can go off, because a lot of different backgrounds and spiritual activity. You're talking about um, open my like you know how people say they have a a veil over their eyes. So you're saying oh, I can yeah. see into the realm and all that. That's what I said. Kind of I like <laughs> those scriptures you reference, so I'll definitely break that down. Oh yeah. Let's break it down. You got to get your third eye open, your pineal gland, brother. Oh, it's calcified, man. It's yeah. calcified. 
got too much calcium. Seriously, not and people say that a lot. You'll be surprised, and they'll mm-hmm. twist that scripture and they'll try to mix it and then say, Oh, you got a gift to see into the specific realms and connect that to prophecy. Like there's some wild stuff out here, man. So I definitely want you to bring that out. So oh yeah, I'm, let me hit on that. And that's the you know, that's the thing. Um, I don't mind, I, you know, I have no problem slowing down and studying these scriptures, you know, verse by verse, word by word, if we have to. Uh, that's why I want people to to get that full revelation of scripture to understand it. So I'm going to pull up 1 Corinthians 2 here. Hey, you can't hear us, honestly. It might be you. Anybody else? Can y'all put ones in the chat if y'all can hear us? Oh, she can hear us now. It looks like okay, cool, perfect. She she wasn't in the spirit right then. That's all oh, there mean. we go. Open your eyes, open your ears now, spiritually. There we go. Yep. Got too much calcium, ma'am. There we go. But man, like this, like I said, like a lot of people have a lot of different belief systems, and then getting to the root of it, understanding this. Uh, all the different ideas that we may have and learn and experience in different religions, different, uh, because you'll be surprised how people bring things from different religions and different belief systems into uh, the Bible. And when, especially when they come out of that stuff, they still have a conditioning that Mm. they may perceive scripture in a certain way. Cause some people like, they will just walk into a church um, and just say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to go, I'm not doing this no more. I'm just going to come to church. And they still may have some understandings, from other ways of life and try to apply it to scripture without letting the Holy Spirit lead them. And that's, and like I said, that's a whole nother struggle for people too. So some people even try to skip ahead of systemic uh, theology, understanding doctrine. They'll try to just jump right in start preaching and doing all this other stuff and don't have the essentials and have this broken down to this degree. So definitely need it. Amen. All right. So it looks like we're good. But it's chat going in on uh sister honestly. Hey, like... <laughs> there we go, JT Max. Suffer not. Hey, suffer not a woman, a mute spirit. All right, so first Corinthians chapter two. Well, I'll, I'll just go all the way up to, to verse one. And let's just go there. Context. Context kills false doctrine. Context matters. So Paul says, and when I came to you. Brothers and sisters, Adelphoi, I did not come with superiority of words or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the witness of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. That should be all of our life's theme verse. To know nothing, to preach nothing but Christ and Him crucified. The Kevin Samuels doctrine. Goodness gracious. Oh. <laughs> I need to stay out this chat, and I'm the one who starts this. Chat. <laughs> is, is karma biblical? <laughs> Type of what? Is karma <laughs> biblical? Uh, Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my word, and you know, his, this is a side note, but historically, a lot of scholars say that Paul was not the best looking person. Like he had a lot of physical things wrong with him, uh, you know, being shipwrecked, being beaten. Um, and some even say his father was the one who gave him a lot of those beatings. Uh, so, you know, he's beating with these lashes. Um, Galatians talks about, you know, his eye problems. Some say he was hunchback. So Paul is like, you know, I'm not this best looking man. I'm not this best speaker. I know this one message and I know it well. And that's Christ and him crucified. And so, yes, you know, you should know a little something about uh, uh, work, you know, using words and preaching and pathos and ethos and all that stuff they teach you. But Paul says, my word and my preaching were not in pervasive words of wisdom which he could do, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not be in the Sophia of men and the wisdom of men, but in 
the power of God. That's where your faith needs to go. Not in that Paul could articulate so well, but it was what was behind Paul. That is what we should put our, our faith in, in the Holy Spirit, that power uh, in Paul. Verse 6, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor the ruler, the rules of this age who are being abolished. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The, the wisdom which, was, which has been hidden, which God predestined before the ages to our glory. And you see how Paul slips in these Calvinistic code words for us? Ah, <laughs> now nah, here we go. You know, he, he writes it in there. Paul knew what he was doing. No, uh, he shout out to Elder Mike. I know. Uh, so so predestined before the ages to our glory, uh, which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. It, it's a cousin of the New American Standard Bible for those uh, people who are wanting. It sounds a little different. Uh, I know in my classroom, uh, when I taught, I would not allow King James translation in my classroom. So, you know, you got to step it up, step your game up. Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which not have entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Oh, I got I got the CSB. I got the CSB. Here we go. But to us, but to us, God has revealed them, the mysteries, through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the pneumatos. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the depths of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the depths of God no one knows except the spirit of God. And when we study the Holy Spirit, we'll hit on these verses in that angle. Uh, we'll go from that angle. Uh, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. So this is the spirit who is sent by God here, um, ek tu theu, uh, so that we may know the depths graciously given to us by God, uh, of which depths we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit. So again, taught by the spirit, this is one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. He, he teaches us. So we're going to see that. Oh, I said no. Okay, we'll, we'll, we can use the KJV. We'll, we'll use the KJV uh, as well. Okay. Uh, that's, people, you, you guys understand I have a weird sense of humor, so you'll, you'll catch on quickly. But here we go. Verse 14. This is what I want to look at. But a natural man, and if you look over here, uh, when well, my cursor is on the right hand side of the screen, Sukikas, the soulish man, the, the unregenerate man. And in Greek, um, when they wanted to emphasize something, they would put it usually first in the sentence. And so the further to the left of the page, something is usually in Greek is the emphasis that they want on it. So the emphasis here. He does, you know, he's he comes right out the bat, Sukikas, the carnal man, the unregenerate man. U Dekatai does not accept, does not welcome, does not make room for the depths of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand it. This natural, not born again, unregenerate man. Cannot understand the things of the spirit. Why? 
because they are spiritually examined. Um, let's bring up another translation, New King James. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. They are moria to him, nor can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. So right here, the Bible is telling us that you can read the Bible. Yes, you don't, you don't have to be saved to read the Bible. You do have to be saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, to understand, to receive the depths and the things of God. So that is what that word uh, receive, dekomai, means, to, to, to accept, to welcome. So the Holy Spirit is required to understand the Bible. Why? Because the Bible is a supernatural book. It is a spiritual book. And so you have to have the spirit to understand the book. So uh, any comments on that, Brother Leo? Yeah, I, I see I see some comments. Um I, I definitely see um what honestly just said she said that's why it's very that's why that's the very why we need both the rational and the supernatural mm. and the spiritual. So that's something I think I'll be honest, like you can go, to, you can lean too far into the natural to where you're looking so much into knowledge and gain all the history and information that you might get, which is great in understanding these things. But like you said, and speaking to the specific scripture here, you cannot understand them because they have a, they are spiritually exclaimed or spiritually discerned. And that is the key that I, I think is missing in a lot of, I will say new believers today, because they are going uh, either, uh, like I know for me, people are hyper spiritual. Because where they don't even want to talk about anything natural, like I know for me, we didn't even talk about biblical history, biblical church history at all. Mm. We didn't even look into any of these things. And we just talk, talk solely about spirituality. Uh, why y'all want to go out and do all these things? You should be in church every day. Come on in and just bless the house, period. That's all we were focused on. But we really didn't have any of the life outside of that. But having that balance. But when it especially comes to the scriptures, it seems like people will read specifically out of their own ideas and beliefs but not relying on the Holy Spirit, because when that actually is challenged on specific questions about the doctrine and theology, they can't stand on it. They're just going all over the place, taking scriptures out of context and applying a myriad of different reasons um, because they're not walking in the spirit. They they have their own idea and bias to kind of place on the scripture rather than just actually interpret it through their Holy Spirit. But that's, that's happening a lot, though. And it, it's it, I feel like doing these type of streams and learning about the word and understanding systemic theology is really going to help those, I hope and pray. Um, but definitely you need to lean on the Holy Spirit when reading our word. Always, always, always. Hey, I agree. Uh, hold on one second. I'm figuring out how to make people moderators and all that. Um, uh, JT Mac, um, I don't know if it's showing on YouTube, but I hit a button and it started trying to delete your comments. I'm not doing it on purpose. Uh, so I want to apologize if it's not showing your comments, but I think they are now. But for some reason, my fat finger hit it and it blocked your comments. So I'm not blocking you. Uh, shout out to, uh, if you see the person that outreached, that's my pastor, uh, Phil, in the, in the comments there. So it's a good brother there. So, yeah, I'm not deleting comments. My finger should hit the wrong buttons. Okay. Oh, so, so you're not just a rogue out here. You got to pass it. That's good. There we, there we go. Amen. Yay. I know that this is going to shock some people. You ready? All right. All right. And he's a white man. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's my brother, Phil. Amen. Phil is, Phil is a, a white man with a black soul. That is my brother right there. Um, All right now, Pastor Phil, former military, so he's. I have to say good things about him. Uh, but yeah, that that yes, I, one of my pastors is is a white man. So throw that out there. So that's very important. That systematic theology, what we're doing now, studying that this is a spiritual activity. Uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter one. Some of you guys should start seeing wrenches pop up too. I just went crazy for a second. Ephesians chapter one. 
to verse 17. All right, so Ephesians 1, 17. Man, Ephesians is a powerful book. Um, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, the glorious Father, may give you, give to you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the full knowledge of him, epigenoso, that, that knowledge that is intimate, it is, it is knowledge upon that, uh, full knowledge of him, so that you, the eyes of your heart, having been enlightened, not your, your physical heart, this is spiritual, so that your, your, the inner man, having been enlightened, will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We're not even going to touch that word saints. Um, so there we see this is a spiritual activity. Paul is praying that if you want to take your prayer level, your prayers to the next level, study the prayers of Paul. They're usually like in the first two chapters of his letters, you like Ephesians and you see Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3, Colossians 1. If you study those and pray those type of prayers for people, it'll take it to like, you know, we, we pray, oh Lord, bless them with a job, bless them with this and that. Paul doesn't even do that. Paul says, Lord, bless them so that they can get a deeper knowledge of you. That is what we should be praying for each other. Um, to know that you got someone out there praying that God will open and pour out more of himself to you, more so you can gain more knowledge of him. You can have a deeper knowledge, a deeper relationship with him. That's powerful. Yes, you know, we can pray people get healed and get all of this, but praying that they have a deep revelation in the fullness of knowledge of Christ. That is what pr real prayer should look like. Uh, any comments on that, Brother Leo? Because with that, once that happens, a lot of the issues that we have doctorally will be solved. Because mm. the Holy Ghost will be leading us rather than we just making up things on our own. And it will definitely fix a lot of issues that we have denominationally, but specifically in our families. I know a lot of people may think about certain things and interpret things differently. But like you just said, as long as we do that, a lot of the issues we have now we saw. Mm. That is so true. All right, so that is a those verses as a spiritual activity. And, and in regards to be, it being a spiritual activity, you can expect some spiritual warfare. You know, a lot of times Satan just ain't gonna let you crack up on no Bible and get into no deep study. Their phone's gonna ring. The cheering going to get on your nerves. Your spouse going to get on your nerves. So this is a spiritual battle. Um, so you get, you can expect some spiritual turbulence as well when you're studying this. Let me get back to our slides here. So honestly, it... Uh, I'm not talking right now, so it's going to be a little bit of silence for one second, sister. But you know I got to mess with her. No problem. I just wanted to thank everybody for jumping on. Um, also, um, I see a couple comments. Uh, and one thing I wanted to just chime in is um, in terms of this specific understanding of going to systemic theology, I do feel a lot of local churches need to start bringing this up more but take out any pride and ego that may be in the leadership that may not know a lot of this information and not be fearful. Let those that have the understanding come in and teach, attend videos like this, um, watch them and just grow our churches to where we have complete understanding and know these things and then apply them locally. Cause a lot of issues we, we experience in our fellowships that don't have understanding may not have knowledge and have a lot of questions. If we understood the essentials and got back to it, it would definitely fix a lot of issues that I see even smaller churches to where pastors may have more, I hate to say, control into the church and how things are functioning and how things are run. 
um, and how the membership can kind of see things. I do see that a lot in smaller churches that they do kind of shy away from specific systemic theology because it is going into understandings that maybe the pastor doesn't even know. So because mm. of that, they, 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 some may fear fearful of that. Because when you start going into scriptures and getting that real understanding and fund, uh, fund foundation in the word, then a lot of the, I would say, bad teaching and doctrine that these pastors may have may start going away and membership may start seeing the issues in the doctrine. And they don't want that. So that's why I see a lot of pastors push away from this and focus solely either go over spiritual or don't even talk about education. They're super spiritual because when you go super spiritual and don't get into the root of the word, understand and get that education and knowledge through the word and rely on the Holy Ghost to show you when that happens, you can see through all that false doctrine, especially at the smaller church, because bigger church is a little bit harder because they try to cover all their bases. And most times some of these pastors do have the education. Mm. To even speak to it so they know how to go through the word specifically but these smaller churches it's a little easier to pick through it because they may not have the be refined and honed into to where you can kind of speak to them about things and these people might get a little intimidated I, I totally agree I think people in the comments are agreeing too that you know it, it's nothing nothing wrong with saying I don't know an you know an answer to something uh, that's why we we're going to see here in is it skipping ahead? Uh, it's so important to study with other believers. Uh, someone will know something you don't know um, and things like that. And so, and this is a good time to actually get in here and study. Uh, you know, you don't have necessarily have to use only Grudem. There's all kinds of theologies that fit your belief, your, you know, denominations and stuff. Uh, and one thing about Grudem, you'll see at the end of his chapter, of every chapter, uh, Grudem will give you, you know, a memory verse for the week, but he will also give you um, in his bibliography there where you can find what he's talking about in other denominational books, theologies. So like if you're a Baptist, he'll list all the Baptist people who talk about this. If you're Armenian, you know, Wesleyan or Methodist, he'll list those. So he's fair in showing you, you know, if you take more of a reformed approach, Here's where you can go to see what I'm talking about. If you're more the Anglican, Anglican approach here. So that's one thing to utilize Grudem's book to the fullest is that he will give you other authors where you can go and read. And so again, you know, you don't have to agree 100% with Grudem. Uh, and the places I don't agree with Grudem, I'll, I'll make it, you know, I'll show you, but I'm always going to be fair in presenting what he presents and things like that. So I see some people are like, yeah, he, he is, he is fair. So how do we study theology? With humility, with humility. God gives grace to the humble, 1 Peter 5. And that's in the present tense is that he continually gives grace to those who are humble. And so you study with the sense of God, I'm coming to you as an empty cup. And you're you just just pour it over into me. Humility allows you to get intimate with God, a deeper intimacy with God. You're you're stripping away your pride. You're stripping away your uh, your preconceived ideas that you come to the scriptures with. So you know, but also we don't want to become prideful and puffed up. We don't want to become prideful and and puffed up when we're studying theology. Um. James chapter 1, verse 19 through 20. Here is a verse, again, that is so taken out of context. Um, but I want us to see this, you know, verse 19 especially. What is he saying in full context? So I'm going to go to James chapter 1. Um, I'm not going to try to pull it up because I don't want to mess up this right now. But James 1. Uh, we'll act. Let's go up to verse. Doo -doo 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 -doo. We'll start at verse twelve to get full context here. James chapter one, verse twelve, full context. Blessed, uh, happy, fortunate, makurios in the Greek, is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, 
that God has promised to those who loved him, who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away, enticed, lured by his own evil desire. And that word own there is when we get our English idiosyncrasies. Satan knows how to tempt you personally. He is not going to tempt me with something that he would tempt uh, uh, Leo with or honestly with because that may not work. Satan knows you personally. He, he knows what to tempt you with. If I don't have a problem with gluttony, he's not going to tempt me with food. If I have a problem with pornography, he's not going to tempt me with anger. So James says each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So God is always giving you know, perfect gifts, good gifts, uh, perfectly suited for us. By his own choice, he gave birth to us by the word of truth. Verse 19, my brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, quick to hear, slow to anger. I mean, slow to speak, slow to anger in regards to what? context in regards to hearing the word of God and to hearing that very same word that birthed your salvation. So the word of God, which we are the same word that, that saves us in context here, James is saying, don't be so, you know, be quick to hear it, be slow to speak and be slow to anger in regards to God's word. Not, you know, when we'll pull this verse or um, see, Brother Leo, how have you heard this verse used? This slow to speak, slow to anger. Uh, oftentimes I've heard that would be, um, I know for me, even in my household, my mom is evangelist. She would say um, the way you're supposed to be taught is before you do something, uh, pray about it and then do something. Um, if some if you get upset by somebody, don't say something out of um, anger or emotion at the time that you may feel you need to do. Um, but like, think about it before you do it. And then I've also heard heard my pastor previously. Uh, they'll use that in terms of, OK, so if somebody comes up to you and um, calls you out your name or calls you anything, really, what's your first response? And if your first response is to do nothing, then uh, you're moving in the right direction because you shouldn't respond instantly off instinct. Always. You got to be, like I said, slow to speak. Uh, I mean, uh, you're slow to speak because once you say something it's out there, it can affect a lot of different people. But I, I know for me, I was taught literally it was just don't let your emotions uh, don't push your emotions to the front. Think before you speak. And so when we when we when we see context, he's dealing with the word of God. Be slow, yeah. be slow to speak when it comes to God's word. Be slow to get anger, to to be angry, uh, quick to hear it. Takos to be wow. swift, to be speedy to That's hear good. it. That's good. That's um, good. Which is is powerful, and there's so many good comments in here. Uh, God, uh, Satan knows our taste buds by what we habitually partake in. So yeah, uh, that, you know, um, again, like, like the video, subscribe, share, hit the notification bell, all kinds of stuff. But yeah, um, Satan knows our taste buds. That's good. So 
with humility. We don't know everything about God's word. Uh, it's going to make you, he's going to show you yourself. It's, it's compared to a mirror here later, later in this passage. It's going to show you how ugly or how beautiful you are, you know, but when, you, when we study God's word, it shows us what we look like. It's going to reveal our hearts and, you know, you got to be prepared to get to get rebuked there because it, it's it's to rebuke us, but also to correct us, to show you where you're wrong and show you how to get it right. That's 2 Timothy 3 talks about that. God's word is going to show you where you're wrong, but also show you how to fix it. So we study this with humility. Um, we study this with help from others, fellow believers, fellow adoify, uh, from the same womb. We, we, we study this together. Allow those with the gift of teaching to teach. Um, and of course, elders, deacons, teaching, the ability to teach um, is one of the qualifications. I know I've been to some churches where them deacons or them elders could not teach a Sunday school class. They couldn't teach the elementary school, but it's, I don't know what it is. You know, we, we just, I was just about to ask you that. I was about to say like, what, what is that? Why do you feel, is this the pastor isn't equipping them to be prepared and ready? Or is it just that they just, I mean, it could be a myriad of things, but to me, like, especially if they're given an opportunity, do you feel like if they were even given opportunities and they still couldn't teach a class? That, that's kind of what was happening. Um, like, 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 possible, like, oh, like, hey, we need so and so to preach today. Like, if you, if they mention somebody's name to you and they're like, oh, they teach on Sunday, like, would you believe it or do you feel like, oh, they are, they, they're not ready for that yet? Oh, oh, there, some of them I'd be like, who? <laughs> and, you know, the thing is, um, if you study, you know, a lot, a lot of times these slides are going crazy. The, uh, the back, cause I come from a, um, Baptist background, missionary Baptist, which we didn't, we never did now one mission. That's a whole nother story. Um, ah. but it seems like, you know, if you gave the most, you know, whoever gives the most money, you know, you can be a deacon or, uh, you know, if you could sing a little bit and moan and rock, you could be a deacon. But I'm sure there are some churches who do this properly. I'm not saying all churches, but some churches, if the past, let's say every person that was, you know, on the pastoral team was sick, church would have to close because the deacons didn't know how they couldn't teach. Good point. And I think we fail in going through those qualifications. They're there for a reason. Um, he gives those there to set, you know, even in Titus, he says, you know, I'm putting you here to set things in order. This is how things, and Crete was a carnal place. And he gives these qualifications, which I think one day we need to go over these qualifications. Um, sometimes we give it and we go directly against the command that he must not be a new convert, a novice, a new, a recent believer. And so we give these people titles and a lot of times their character is not matching up with these qualifications uh he must uh able to teach some people will even say some scholars even say that that greek word means he is teachable and again a lot of those elders a lot of deacons fail there you can't teach them nothing because they think i'm 60 70 years old you can't teach me nothing and so can you teach, but also are you teachable? And so I think that when we hit those gifts and we hit those qualifications, uh, definitely uh, go over that. But again, we should allow those who clearly have the gift of teaching to teach. And the person who has the gift of teaching, usually they're, they're excited to teach. This is this is what they live to do. 
And so, you know, we if you know someone who has a gift of teaching, say, hey, can you help me through this, you know, this doctrine? So humility, pride plays a part um, in that. So our study of theology, this is page 35 um, in my copy. Our study of theology should include talking with other Christians, bouncing things off, not necessarily, not be careful not to form an echo chamber, but even get people who go to a different church. You know, hey, what what do you, what do you see in this verse? You know, let's let's look at this. Oh, that's uh, that's that's gonna cause problems now, man. Because now you people are gonna be seeing learning other things, different theology, understanding that's not silo within that <laughs> one church, man. That's ah, I like that though because I just know a lot of people don't do that because I yep. know for me. I know for me, I, I've heard it. I'm not going to speak too much on it just because I'm not sure who's watching. But uh, uh, if you say certain things or learn, if they, they'll say, hey, uh, you got to watch who you listen to, which I agree on. But also you need to be able to interact with people. I don't see why that'll be an issue with talking to other believers in different congregations or even listening to another pastor on a particular type of doctrine or uh, specific scripture. Um, there are some leaders that actually frown upon that. They only want you to, why would you look elsewhere when you're getting so much sound doctrine and teaching here? And that's kind of what they'll focus on and say, you should just solely listen to what we're talking about and who I bring in here rather than you go out there, which I understand you may try to protect the flock from uh, false doctrine, but there are some people that understand and have great discernment and the Holy Spirit is leading them. They don't understand which is wrong and which isn't. So it's just interesting to see that. I'm glad you made that point, Rev. Yep. Uh, there's a comment, uh, sister, honestly, say, I don't want to pass it by. Uh, is teaching the same as preaching and pastoring? Ah, good question. Because many conflate the terms. That's very good. Um, I will say, uh, oh, Sister Lewis said, uh, right, some people are territorial about their sheep. Oh, man, that'll preach. Um, is teaching the same as preaching and pastoring? Teaching is breaking down and explaining concepts you're 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 instructing them whereas preaching uh teaching the dasko uh in the greek preaching karux or karux uh is a it was used of a uh, the town herald he would go in before the king would come and his job was to proclaim what the king told him to say not his own, put his own flavor and remix it. If the king told you to say, hey, I'm coming Tuesday at five o'clock, that's what the Corux did. And so as a preacher, you're proclaiming what the king has sent you to say. Teaching is you're getting in here and you're breaking down these doctrines for the disciples. You you know you're taking what the king has said and making it more uh, chewable and digestible to people. Uh, but so, yeah, some people you know they they conflate that gift of teaching and preaching and pastoring. So yep, yeah, let's see. All right, so I hope that kind of answered that. But that's a very good point. Very good point. Um, teaching and pastoring. Because I know some preachers, some pastors, they preach, but they can't teach. You know, they can. Now, they you, can go ahead. Now, when you say when you say preach, are you meaning like the. Uh, they can speak very, or you're saying like they sound really good in what they're saying and preaching of the word, but not really breaking it down. Like they can literally yeah. recite, they can recite the Bible and sound amazing reciting the yes. Bible. But in terms of understanding and, and teaching and actually bringing up what the word is saying, they really lack in that. And so he here's an example, and I'm, I'm sure this will probably get my YouTube shut down. So, you know, if this is the last time I see uh -oh. you guys, it was good. T.D. Jakes, <laughs> the man can preach, but the man cannot teach. I, I haven't seen him take a scripture and break it down and teach it. He can take a scripture and bounce off of it like a, a diving board, which they, you know, they pull scriptures and they go, they, they bounce off. 
But you know, TD Jakes has other problems, the theologically wise, theological wise. But you know, if you look at some of his books, there's there's not no reference to no scriptures in there. There's not no breakdown of scripture. Um, the whole "Woman Thou Art Loose" conference and burst out of his book. You know, he preached a sermon. He pulled one phrase out of a text, "Woman, you are loose," and then bounced all kinds of conferences and books come from that. When you're not, you you did not explain anything about that passage, that story, and so people can get up there, they can they can hoop, they can holler, they they can hit those runs, but in the end, it's like, well, what did you say? I, I left empty. You know, I sweated, but. You know, I may have ran and cut a rug, but I'm not spiritually edified, if that makes sense to people. It does. I, I will say there is a I have his memory. I forgot the brother's name. His older pastor years ago when I was in high school, I think. Uh he didn't hoop the best. I'll be honest. I'm say I was at Pentecostal church, but he came and preached at a mega church uh, where mm. I was at. And I will remember this forever. Like he was speaking on um how like like this literally the, the he said <laughs> people talk, yeah, Dumas is wilding. <laughs> But I was saying, like, he was speaking on a specific subject, and I was young. And the he took his little, he took at least about five minutes within like five scriptures and just kept reviewing and breaking down the dynamics of God is in heaven. He said, as it is in heaven, how it is in the earth. And he was really just breaking that down. But to mm. me, it's like, I've heard that scripture so much, and they'll gloss over it, kind of relate that to either a blessing and just that's it. They don't really understand the dynamics between the two, understanding the spirit realm and understanding um, what our actual deeds are doing, relationship to sin. And he brought it back to Cain and Abel, how he was saying sin is crouching at the door. I'm sure Abel or I mean, Cain couldn't physically see what sin was, but like that, that was kind of the what our actions do. And he was speaking to it and I was like, man, like I haven't heard someone bring this out, but he wasn't hooping and hollering. He was just talking. And literally mm. was speaking to it to a certain degree and going deeper into the word and then understanding to other scriptures and then breaking those down and cross-referencing. And it was interesting. He didn't just cross over with one. He would just go to one and start reciting a few. And then he'll say, now, when I, before I finish this, y'all need to go back and read it yourselves. And it was like, it's interesting. I never heard, no because at that church, I just didn't hear people do that. It was literally just speak on it, sound good, recite the word real good, and add all your uh, your own personal beliefs on the scripture interpretation and make that sound good and talk for like that for about a good 25 30 minutes make sure the music is cued and you're good to go but they didn't really break down the scripture to even understanding and uh, i mean let alone let's not talk about those that randomly throw greek and hebrew in there but those that actually understand it and mention it uh, it's very rarely you hear that especially in the charismatic church yep and you know you know and the thing is some people will say, you know, uh, uh, you know, if they're, they're, and if we're honest, there are certain preachers that in the black community, if you touch, you know, people are going to go great. You, you don't talk about their Jakes and, you know, you don't talk about, you know, some of them love Joyce Meyer, things like that. But, um, but yeah, you know, and I've been preaching since, well, I've been ordained since 2009, but I've been preaching ever since I was eight. I would preach on the front porch, and I've always had a – it's weird to say I. it was like I've been nothing but destined to be a preacher and a teacher ever since I was very little. Um, I was teaching the men's Sunday school class at the age of 10 and 11 because they had really no one, you know, but I was able to teach at that level just because of the way God blessed me with the, the gifts that I have with memory and things like that. But show you my hoop, most excellent. You know, <laughs> I went to, um, here in Indianapolis, um, I used to be on staff at St. John's Missionary Baptist Church where, uh, the Reverend Dr. Philip L. Show was my pastor. And uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 there's some videos of me on YouTube. I, I have to, I'll link you guys, I'll show you guys them where uh, Rev C did get a hoop going. And, you know, but that, that's in the past. That's the old days. I'm old now. I'm LeBron in the, with the Lakers now. Um, but honestly, as a past, as a preacher, you can get up there, you can, you feel the congregation. You know, 
and this is the human side of you. If I preach, if I say, you know, this, 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 and this, I can pull on their heartstrings. I can find a scripture somewhere to reference it and pull it. But, you know, so that's the human side of, you know, sometimes we get caught up in that show that, man, if I can get them to hoop a little bit, get the organ going. So, you know, there's that aspect of, because preaching is a, is an art, it's a skill. You know, you don't want to be boring. There is some aspects of personality that needs to be there. But overall, are you preaching and teaching the word of God? That's the thing. Uh, so oh, what's, you better not say nothing about Jamal Bryant. I'm not going to say nothing about Jamal Bryant. Uh, but there are some good pastors out there. I, um, there's uh, Marvin. Oh, man. I'm drawing a blank on him right now. Marvin Wiley, I think it's Marvin Wiley. Y'all got to help me out in the chat. Marvin Wiley's good. Um, but there's some good there's some good hoopers. And if you can hoop and teach and get those two together, man, you're something else. But uh, move along. I have to. And we can probably continue this later if I don't get through all these slides because this is good. But legally, I do have to pick up my children from school soon. So I guess I do have to speed it up a little bit. But uh, we study by collecting and understanding all the relevant passages on a topic. Um, so you find all the relevant verses. Is my, is my mic working? Am I, can I be heard? Can you guys hear? Okay, yes, okay. I feel like I went quiet. All right, so you find all the relevant verses on a topic. Oh, man, I hit the wrong button. I did not mean to do that. Looks like I'm going to be looking for another church Sunday, guys. But anyway, I timed out my pastor by mistake. Uh, you So you read, make notes, and try to summarize those points on those passages. So if you're studying angels, you're going to look at all the relevant Old Testament passages, New Testament passages. Um, you're not going to go get some random verse somewhere uh, in Proverbs trying to say, oh, this is an angel. No, you, is it relevant to what we're studying? You make notes, you try to summarize those points, and then we put those into what you find. You put one or two of those points together, and you know this is what the Bible affirms about this topic. Uh, yes, Van Harris, that's the, Matt King Carter was a monster. If you guys look him up on YouTube, uh, he even has a, there's a good, I go back to this video at least once a month of him teaching um, a workshop on how to preach and study for Dewey Smith, E. Dewey Smith. Uh, Matt Carter could hoop. He could exposit the word like no other. Uh, photographic memory, knew the Greek, knew the Hebrew. And like while he was preaching, he would give you the Greek, spell it in Greek, spell it in English just instantly, just off the top of his head. So that's good that, you know, even in this chat, uh, drop some good biblical preachers for people who can look at on YouTube and stuff. Uh, Frank Earl Ray, uh, that man, I think he had the entire Bible memorized. So, so yeah, that's very good, very good. Move to the next slide. And here we go. H.B. Charles. Yep. Yep. So study theology with rejoicing and praise. Uh, that's toward the end of the chapter, chapter 130 on page 37, 38. We study the living God with passion. He is alive. He gives us life. And so he is an exciting he is exciting to learn about. Yes, we, we will never reach the depths of God. He is incomprehensible. 
That's a good three, $3 word. He is incomprehensible. But what he does allow us to know about him is great. He That is an act of grace that he reveals things about himself. So we, we, we study, we love him with our heart. That's your emotion, the mind. That's your intellect, your, your, your body. And so you, you study God with our mind. That's a lot of time. We, we love him with our minds. And so we leave that off a lot of times, but he gave you a mind to use. Um, and so we rejoice when we think about, uh, in Psalm 139, it talks about when you think about how much God thinks about you, you know, the thoughts, and, and there's praise that comes from that. Um, for those who fought, you know, on Berean the other night, Berean, uh, that Holy Ghost got to Berean a little bit and broke out into that praise a little bit. And uh, Psalm 139, 17, God, how precious your thoughts are to me. How vast is their sum. And so when you think about that, that should lead to rejoicing. That should lead to uh, praise. Uh, let me see. Yeah, Matt Chandler. Uh, I'm looking at the comments. Paul Paul Washer. Paul Washer gets you saved all over again. Uh, that's my king. That is uh, S, uh, S-M. Uh, it's slipping my mind. Somebody have to look at that. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, there's nothing wrong with listening to preachers who are not your color. That We got to get away from that. You know, there's nothing wrong with listening to some Charles Stanley, some some uh, Steve Lawson, uh, things like that. So there, there's nothing wrong with listening to those uh, people. Hey, yes, Lockridge, that's him. Yep, Lockridge. Uh, Psalm 19, uh, we look at those and how the psalmist talks about, uh, he speaks about the, you know, studying God's word with rejoicing. Um, how is God's word is like honey. And so there, there's passion, there's rejoicing, there's praise. Every, you know, a good practice is that every time you, you find something new about God, take that as a praise moment. Uh, in Romans 11, verse 30, 36, down in that area, uh, Paul, Paul is writing, you know, Romans 9, 10, 11, those are some deep, divisive chapters in Roman, heavy theology. Paul is writing, 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 teaching, teaching, teaching. And then he takes a spiritual praise break. And Paul says, oh, the depths of the riches and the knowledge of God. Bathos, the, the depths, the deepness of God. And so Paul is writing these letters and he just has to put, he just has to have a praise break, as we say. And there's nothing wrong with studying God's word and then having, you know, having a whole praise break when you get through. Uh, sometimes you have to put put the Bible to the side because it gets so good to you. And you get that that uh, that Baptist rock going. You have to hug yourself, keep the Holy Ghost in. Uh, so, yes, yeah, there's nothing wrong with studying theology with excitement, with praise of the great God. All right. And so the, the next. Yeah, I need to. All right. So the next lesson that we have, we're going to be in chapter three. Chapter three is about the canon. And we're going to look at how we got the Bible, manuscripts, apocrypha, all those things. Yes, I said the word apocrypha, deuterocanonical books. Um, and sometimes there, there's, there's nothing wrong with listening to a person who has expertise in those areas, like the canon. I often refer people to uh, Dr. James White. A lot of people, you know, they have some issues with James White, but James White, you know, you can get the truth from him and, you know, however else you feel about him, you know, if it's truth, it's truth. And so Dr. James White is an expert and, you know, him, Michael Kruger, those are experts in uh, biblical canon. They know more than me. So I refer people to them. I watch them a lot. 
So there, there's nothing wrong with watching and listening to people who are experts in certain areas. And so the canon, we'll look at that. Yeah, church history, uh, the canon, Dr. James White is where you want to go. And if you, if you don't believe Dr. James White knows his stuff, go ask Elder Raka. Ch check that out. Ask him how that went. Uh, shout out to Elder Raka. The Doctrine of the Word of God, Chapter 2. We'll try to get through these slides here. So, the Word of God. Dispensational Tim, you don't like James White, man? James White. Uh, John MacArthur, all those good people. Um, so, the Word of God. Again, uh, again thank you guys for your for hanging in here, studying God's word with us, you know, laughing and fellowshipping with each other. But it's all about God, all about Christ. Um, and so I enjoy this. So, again, thank you. You know, hit the like button, subscribe, share, um, share on Facebook, YouTube, all that good stuff. So the word of God. Uh, and, and in here, uh, Grudem is breaking it down. And he, you know, he talks about what are the different forms of the word of God. And so one of those forms is uh, the word of God as a person. This is known as the logos or the logos, however you want to say it, Jesus Christ. This is the word of God as a person. And so John 1.1, 1, 1, we can, I don't want to go, we can spend hours there. Oh, no, Elder Mike is in here. Oh, Elder Mike. Uh, I haven't said nothing about Calvinism, Elder Mike, so we're good. <laughs> Don't want to get flagged. But no, yeah, shout out to Elder Mike. Subscribe to his channel. Uh, Elder Mike is a beast, beast in the word of God. Uh, her, I think he has hermeneutics. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, someone get that timestamp and tell Elder Mike I talk good about him. Uh, shout out to his, you know, his hermeneutics class, which is needed. Uh, shout out to uh, uh, Des Ingram. Shout out to y'all. So the word of God. See, now I'm nervous. Elder Mike in here. No. So the word of God as a person, Jesus Christ, the Lagos. Um, this is important because Christ, and, you know, we're not even going to get into, because it's been too much time. Um explaining the deity of Christ here, things like that. Cause I told you guys, I got to get my children legally. I have to pick them up from school. So I want to make this a little quick here, but the word of God in the form of a person, Jesus Christ, the incarnation, the infleshing of Christ, of God, Christ and his words communicate the character of God to us and his will. See, Dunamis, you start messing here, Dunamis. Start mess. See, I didn't give Dunamis a wrench, did I? Make sure I didn't do that. Uh, so, yeah, but no, the, the it, it's we, we need more systematic teaching and studying of God's word. So any, any good channel I see, you know, I try to, you know, Elder Mike is a good channel to check out. Uh, things like that. So, so Christ, as the word of God, communicates, literally in John 1.18, he exegetes God to us. He, he gives us the character of God, the will of God. And so that's very, very important. Then you have the word of God as speech. The word of God as speech. So this is, again, we're in, uh, this is chapter two of Grudem, page 47 in my in my copy. And so this is where you get the decrees of God. Uh, so, so those are the eternal calls. The decrees of God are eternal. They cause events to happen and things to come into being. You know, uh, Genesis 1-1 and, you know, how God creates everything by his word, which we call the fiat creation. He speaks and it was. He speaks and it was. 
And so a decree of God is a word of God that causes something to happen. Uh, so Psalm 33, 6. Uh, and that's powerful when you think that God Almighty created everything by speaking it into existence. I don't think he really had to exert any energy. It's just light be. And that's literally what the Hebrew light be, light be. And it was. And so the decrees of God are his eternal purpose, according to his will, whereby he has ordained whatever comes to pass. And so, you know, however, whatever view, you, car, um, Calvinism, Armenianism, whatever you want to be, there are decrees of God. They are eternal because God is eternal. Um, and so those are, you know, his decrees that he, he does there. But, you know, Psalm 33, 6, by the word of God, the heavens were made. All the hosts by the breath of his mouth. Um, so that is powerful. And then Hebrews 1 tells us that Christ is the one who is continually, present tense, upholding the universe by the word of his power. By the word of his power. That is a powerful, the powerful God that we serve. The true biblical God is worthy of uh, worship and praise and studying. God's word of personal address. God's word of personal address. And there, it was in the Hebrew is known as the bat kol, the bat kol, the voice of God. Uh, so it could literally be translate uh, the the daughter of the voice, which speaks speaks of its its uh, quietness, its in, you know its intimateness, uh, the voice of God. And so God's word. Oops, let me go back. When He communicates. Sorry. So this is God's communication with people on earth by personally speaking with them. Now, I will say this. I will say this. God is not speaking out loud to anyone alive on this planet today. You speaking to God is prayer. God speaking to you is schizophrenia. That's a joke. But if you want to hear God speak out loud, read the Bible out loud. So God is not verbally yelling your name and speaking to you. God speaks to us through his word, through the spirit. Uh. Hey, shout out to Berean, Berean TV. Uh, what's going on here? What's going on? I, pl I plumber. Did I miss something with Van Harris? I'm checking the comments. So, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, God, yeah, God, God does speak through the Holy Spirit in the insight, through his word, through the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But you are not hearing a voice from heaven saying, this is God, do this, do that. No, 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 no. The people who God spoke to in the Bible heard actual words of God. They were hearing the very voice of God. Those words had absolute authority and they were absolutely trustworthy. So when God spoke to Adam and said in Genesis 2, and the Lord spoke, commanded the man saying, you may freely eat. That is God literally speaking words out loud to Adam. 
um, Exodus 20, God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, uh, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Matthew 3, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. So in each of those instances, God speaks words of personal address so that the people could clearly understand that those were the actual words of God. They were hearing God's word. And if they disobeyed those, they were disobeying God. So that's that on there. So Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. Or let, let's do this. Type of one, type of one, if you think God speaks out loud to people today. Type of one, type a one, if you think God speaks out loud to people today. Type of two, type two, if you think God speaks to us through his word, through his spirit. So type one, if you think God speaks out loud verbally to people. Type of two, if you think God speaks to us through his word, through the spirit. Hey, they're good them twos. Hey, God. You know, and uh, shout out. Where's, uh, where's Roger at? Shout out to Roger. Um. Uh, if someone tells you, God told me to tell you, no, no, he didn't. God did not tell you to tell me anything. God has my phone number. He has my email. He has my Twitter account, Telegram, whatever these people are using. God has those. God did not tell you to tell me anything. So again, this may be my last time speaking to y'all, you know, so I'm going to get it all out. Uh, no, but, you know, hey, we're biblical. We have to be biblical. Have to be biblical. Good. Seeing some twos. Seeing some twos. Or, you know, when when we hear, like, I think what uh, J-Mac uh, Mac is saying here, uh, <laughs> Elder Mike, Elder Mike. Well, I, lo I love you, Elder Mike. <laughs> God told me to tell you don't teach Calvinism. Uh, touche, touche. Um, but no, you know, I'm getting away from Calvinism. I told you, Elder Mike, I'm teaching Calvinism, the five points of Chick-fil-A. That tulip that Chick-fil-A got, that's what I'm teaching. That's biblical there. Well, can you imagine how many people would have got saved if Jesus would have served them Chick-fil-A when he fed the 5,000? How many of those people would have actually still followed him had he served them Chick-fil-A? But that's a different, I digress. If, you know, Jesus passing out them little sandwiches in them bags where the, the sandwiches stays hot when they pass them out to you. Good God Almighty. Talking about a time. We had a time last night. Um... I'm so sidetracked. Okay, God's word in written form. God's word. See, someone's going to clip that and say that I said Jesus fed those people Chick-fil-A sandwiches. I know it. But God's word was in written form. That's the Bible in written form. 66 books in the closed canon. You're going to hear that next week. We're going to get on those those. We can't get on those uh, commands. I mean, those uh, those books in the canon. So the Ten Commandments. Uh, you know, some people say, well, that's anthropomorphic language where it was used by the finger of God, but it, it speaks of its authority behind it. Those Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, literally were from God. They were authoritative. They are still considered his own words. And so you can look at those uh, scriptures there. What page is this in uh, the book? I want to make sure. I I'm back too, by the way. I Man, you, you you just I missed me. a lot. <laughs> I know, my bad. <laughs> but you I, need I a just buzzer had a call. Man. Yeah, I had a call. Oh, you're work. Fine. So, but um, what page is this? I want to make sure I got this down. This is good. 
Uh, we're up in page uh, 48, 49. Perfect. I was already there. All right, make it sure. There we go. 48, 49. Perfect. All right. Can you can, can the chat? Can you guys still hear me? Someone said I need to go get my mind right. I all see right, you've, so, been, you've been talking about Calvinism on here. You've been going in. No, no. Elder Mike come in and you know, <laughs> running the muck. Running the whole muck. And see, I go, I, I respect his channel. I respect his comment section. But no, he, he said that the Lord told him that I shouldn't be teaching Calvinism out loud. So, oh, let me see. Dudamis got a nice comment <laughs> here. So he says, So from what you're saying, Ref, see, how do we fight against uh, is eisegesis by saying God speaks only from the 66 today? And would all scriptures apply to the entirety of the Bible if we want to be in context? I can read that again. Mm -hmm. So he says, so Ref C, how do you fight against eisegesis by saying God speaks only from the 66 today? Um, yeah. So with eisegesis, you know, that's when you're you're reading into the text. Um, and so not, not, I don't think, you know, that's you're saying, you know, well, the book of Jasher, let's pull this into, that can be, you know, that can be a form of eisegesis. But exegesis is you're going in there you're, you're pulling out the truths that are there. You're not putting things into the text. And so the 66 that we have are sufficient for salvation. They are sufficient for godliness. Everything you, you need to be saved, to live a godly, sanctified, Holy Ghost-filled life <laughs> is found in these 66 books. Um. And would all scripture apply to the entirety of the body if we want to be in context? I'm trying to understand that question a little bit. Um, I'll probably hit, I'm gonna hit that question later because I have to run here soon. Uh, but I'll come back to your question, Dunamis. I'll answer that one. Uh, but did you hear about the Chick Fil A, Leo? Did you hear that part? I didn't hear about the Chick-fil-A. What's going on with Chick-fil-A? Uh, we were talking about how um, I was telling Elder Mike that, you know, I don't, I'm not Calvinist anymore. I'm Calvinism. So I support uh, Chick-fil-A and their tulip that they have. And I was like, can you imagine if Jesus would have fed those 5,000 Chick-fil-A sandwiches, how many believers he would have had there? Hey. You know? So the thousand year reign, for example. All scripture. Let's see. Dunamis, I'm gonna have to. You have to shoot me a, a message on Facebook or something. I can. I, I I don't want to give you a poor answer. So uh, I'm gonna give you. A, I don't want a poor answer. So I'm not gonna. You know, I, I respect everyone's questions enough to give them a, a proper answer. Um, but I'm I'm up against time right now, so that's the only reason, Dunamis. Uh, let's see. And Berean was in here again. Shout out to Berean. Uh, see, when we started speaking of that Calvinism, all the people just come out the woodworks. <laughs> I mean, that I, I, seems like that's always a, a, a <laughs> interesting topic, but um, but this is good oh, though. Yeah. Uh, I've been paying attention. I just was at a, on a call. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, no problem. No problem. Uh, again, you know. The, the, for the people in the chat who will hear this, me and Elder Mike, we, we are brothers in Christ. We get along perfectly. Uh, we just joke about Calvin. You know, that's it's not a salvific issue. We just joke. We go back and forth. So uh, Psalm 1. This is, I think, I want to end here. Uh, and then this is a powerful. So we, this is going to be good. So Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Uh We'll hit here and then we'll close. So we'll next week or you know I'll let you guys kind of know when, but probably next week or so we'll do chapter three of Grudem. We're only going to take chapter three because it's so the topic is so massive. So chapter three is probably like maybe twenty pages. It's on the canon of scripture. Oh snap! Yeah, the canon of scripture. And so, uh, 
on page 52 of the book, this is what this is the memory verse that Grudem gives about the word of God, the Psalm 1, 1 through 2. Um, and so it says, let's go here. All right, Bill, that's fine. Hey, man, back here. He speaks consistent with the 66, but not just by the 66. Okay. Psalm 2. All right, Psalm 1. Here we go. This is the, the, the hymnal of the children of Israel, the, the songbook of the nation. How happy, how blessed, or it in the Hebrew it's plural, so it's Oh, the blessedness of the man uh, who, who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, nor stand in the path with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, the Torah, the law, and he meditates on it day and night. So here, this chapter, uh, this chapter here, and or this this book of Psalms, this number one here, um, it speaks of the centrality of the Torah and how a godly life is a blessed life because it's 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 centered on the instructions of God. So this man is not walking in the counsel of the wicked. And so notice this, this downward decline. He, he's walking, then he slows down to standing, then he sits. Uh, this progression here. Instead, his delight is in the law of Yahweh. That's where our delight should be, in God's word. We meditate day and night. We, we, we mutter. We roll it over in our minds. We look at it from all sides. We chew on it. Again, this is this goes shows us uh, the the sufficiency of Scripture because you don't need to focus and chew on the traditions of man. The Word of God is enough; it's sufficient. But it's you can never fully extract everything from a passage. That progressive revelation, the illumination of the Holy Spirit. You can look at. A verse, you know, we talked about it, looking at a verse over and over again and see something new every single time. And so as believers for this week, as we I'm getting ready to wrap this up, focus on God's word. When we think about and we'll look at this as when we look at how we got the Bible, the, the, the people who were killed and martyred, burned alive for you just to have a paper copy of. Uh, we're so blessed to have a paper copy of the Bible. These people gave their lives, burned at the stake, so that they could translate it into, so people could understand it. We have people over in the Middle East and in China who they have literally pages of the Bible, and they're more excited than some of us who have at least 20 copies of the Bible in our house. And I know y'all got that one Bible that's sitting up in your windshield that's getting all curled up from the sun with, your, with you know, Big Mama's obituary stuck in it. And the way we, you know, and so that we value the word of God for what it is. It's his revelation of himself to us. We meditate on it. And so that, you know, that's the blessedness that we have as we study uh, God's word. And so we're going to get ready to end. You guys can continue to put comments, uh, questions, like, subscribe, share, all of that. We'll definitely, I'm looking forward to doing this more, getting more frequent. Uh, I'm going to fix the technical issues having. So next week or whenever we meet again, we're going to be in chapter three of uh, Grudem's book on the canon of scripture. So bring your apocryphas and all that, and I'll show you where to put them. Where those Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'll show you where to go. So um, I will get ready to close us out in prayer again. Thank you guys for uh, hanging in there. 
uh, like, share, subscribe, all of that. Uh, go subscribe to Berean's channel. Subscribe to Elder Mike's channel. Anybody else who got a channel, uh, honest, sister honestly has a great channel. Subscribe to all of us. Subscribe to Leo's channel. Let's let's continue to build. So let's pray, and we will uh, be dismissed, as they say. So, Father, Father God, we thank you for being God all by yourself. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We, we can't praise you and thank you enough for salvation. Lord, thank you for the time that we had that we could freely study your word without persecution. Father, we have an embarrassment of riches here in regards to Bibles and translations and commentaries. Give us a hunger to dig into your word. Apply it to our lives or that we will never forget that theology it's not a hat that we wear on our head, but theology is shoes for our feet so that we can walk it out. Lord, I pray for everyone who is watching, who will watch, uh, that you will bless them according to your will. Bless them in their inner man. Give them a deeper revelation and hunger for you. And I pray that you will bring people across our paths that we can share seeds of the gospel with. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Um, I'll have this posted up on YouTube soon with the links to the slides. Thank you, Leo. I appreciate it. Thank man. you. Likewise, brother. God bless everyone.